The stories found in the Old Testament oftentimes have hidden meanings to them. The stories of Adam, the story of Abraham, the story of Noah and others tell an allegorical view of God's great plan of the ages. On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to discuss this meaning of allegory. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. And J.R., as we discuss allegory <clears throat> and continue our discussion, uh, we should note that of all the books I think ever written, the Bible speaks allegorically, that is figuratively, I think more than any other book that this has ever been compiled. Allegory, according to uh, the uh, New Collegiate uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is uh, the expression by means of symbolic figures and actions, actions of truths or generalizations about human existence. So what we're talking about here is symbolic representations of truth. And all of the characters in the Bible, basically the biographies, if you will, in the Bible, are really huge extended symbols. Sometimes they begin in the Old Testament and, and you don't see the conclusion of them until far into the New Testament. What is so fascinating to me about these stories in the Old Testament is that they have deep meanings, deeper meanings than you can see on the surface of the story. Uh, take, for example, Abraham. Abraham is the father of us all. The Jewish people call him Father Abraham. His covenant is the covenant under which grace is presented to Gentiles. And uh, so on today's program, we want to show you that Abraham is a, an allegory of God, the father of us all. Mm. And that's the first point. Abraham is a type of God. A type of God, and of course, since he's called Father Abraham, and since he functions as the elder of all the redeemed, the seed of the of the house of David later on, and also uh, the father of the of the uh, righteous Gentiles uh, in the age to come, then he would be a type of uh, God the Father. When we say type, mm -hmm. that's just a word that means a figure or a symbol, and allegory is nothing different than speaking in symbolic language. Now, Abraham had three wives. There was Sarah, Hagar, and later Keturah. Let's look at these three. Mm -hmm. If Abraham is a type of God the Father, then we are told in the scripture that two of his wives, Hagar and Sarah, are allegories of law and grace. Let's look at that, Gary. Beginning, I guess, in Galatians chapter 4. Yeah, Galatians 4. Now, the book of Galatians, uh, I think is Paul's most emotional writing. He was really on uh, when he wrote Galatians. I mean, it's, it's his magnum opus, sometimes called the Magna Carta of freedom in Christ, where he declares that we're free from the law. And so on that basis, when Paul begins to write, he actually incorporates the word allegory in uh, chapter 4 of Galatians. And we read this. <clears throat> For it is written, this is Galatians 4.22 and following, that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from, Mount Sin from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. And we could go on from there, but Paul says it extraordinarily clearly. Okay, so if Hagar was a picture of the law and her son Ishmael mm -hmm. uh, was the son of the bondwoman, he was the result of law. Yes. That makes then Sarah a type of grace. And her offspring, Isaac, uh, was a type of Christ. And so she is a type of the new covenant, which is grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is most important that we understand these two characteristics. Here are two great religions, Judaism and Christianity. We have Hagar as a type of the law, the old covenant, and Sarah, a type of the new covenant. Now, Gary, Abraham had a third wife, uh -huh. Keturah. Keturah. And uh, in fact, it, it talks about in the book of Genesis that uh, Keturah bore him certain sons and that um, 
these sons were given gifts and then sent away. They were not allowed to be heirs with Isaac. Uh -huh. In fact, even Ishmael was sent away. He was not allowed to be an heir with Isaac. Only the son of the free woman, that is, those who are saved by grace, are heirs of the kingdom. So it really sounds like we have three religions here. Three religions. Yeah. <laughs> there are three great religions yeah. in the world that are, that are offshoots of this covenant of Abraham. We have Judaism, uh -huh. Christianity, and then there is Islam. Could Keturah be an allegory of Islam? Now, the Bible itself does not go that far, but remember in the days when Galatians was written, there was no such thing as Islam. It was yet in the future. It came along in the fifth century or so. It's kind of interesting that uh, when Abraham married Keturah, we have in Genesis 25 2, uh, she bare unto him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Well, these, uh, if you trace the lineages, J.R., would be the tribes of, uh, of the desert peoples down in what would today be Saudi Arabia. And uh, it, it suggests then that we're talking about uh, the area of Mecca and Medina, really, which became the heart of that third religion we're talking about. And you know, speaking of uh, Islam, actually Ishmael is a part of Islam. And yet in the scriptures, his mother Hagar is a type of Sinai, which gendereth to bondage. Mm -hmm. That is the law. Now it's interesting to me that in that regard, the law, this, this bondage, is akin to Islam. Mm -hmm. So Islam is a religion of bondage as well. Now to complete this story, or to really to make, it, make the foundation complete, <clears throat> we should talk about Abraham and Sarah. We've already done that in another context, but remember when Ab Abram was called, he was not Abraham, he was Abram. And he uh -huh. came into the promised land. God changed his name to Abraham, or Avraham, high father. And he changed Sarah's name, which used to be Sarai, which can mean either dominant or it comes from the, the Hebrew word sar, which means prince. So we could call her princess. Uh -huh. God changed her name to Sarah, which is queen. So we have Father Abraham and his queen, and then the three branches coming. You know, if Sarah is a type of New Testament Christianity, which Galatians 4 says she is, uh -huh. that means that we are the queen. That the New uh -huh. Testament church is going to rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, Christ is the king and we're his bride. Yeah. So we really have a, an allegory here in the very story of uh, this father of the faith mm. and the Abrahamic covenant. So we've talked about one third of the Godhead now, the father. Mm -hmm. And that's where the story gets interesting. They had a son named Isaac. Let's look at Isaac for a few moments. Take, for example, the birth of Isaac. The birth of Isaac was a miracle birth. His mother was past the age of childbearing, uh -huh. and God had to perform a miracle in her womb for her to be able to bear Isaac. That's an allegory. It is typical of the miracle birth of Jesus Christ. Yes, it is. And that's not all, because we find that as we study the life of Isaac, there is much about him that is typical of Christ. Therefore, he becomes the second, uh, the type, shall we say, or symbol. Uh, or in his walk through life, he became allegorically, allegorically representative of the Son, or Christ. There was a day when God told Abraham to take Isaac, take him up to Mount Moriah, and sacrifice him. That's a type of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And the interesting thing to me about this is that Isaac went willingly. He willingly gave himself. The Lord Jesus Christ also willingly gave himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now you know, God had told him to offer him on Mount Moriah for a burnt offering. And uh, when the young lad and his father approached the mountain, Isaac said, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where's the lamb? 
And Abraham said to his son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. That's a prophecy. This whole thing is an allegory of mm -hmm. the substitute lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, even the place they went uh, for the sacrifice, Mount Moriah, later became the site of the Temple Mount and all of the events that led up to the crucifixion of Christ. In the allegory of Abraham, we shall note that Abraham is a type of God the Father, which makes his son Isaac a type or an allegory of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We can see that in the miracle birth of Isaac, and we can see it in the sacrifice of Isaac. He indeed was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gary, mm -hmm. the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that Jesus was the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. This sounds like a fulfillment of Isaac's being willing to lay himself down on that altar. Absolutely. It, it, Jesus was obedient to the point of complete humiliation. And we find this quality in Isaac. And it's interesting, as we alluded just before the break, that uh, uh, the same place that Abraham took Isaac for this sacrifice was to become the site of the real sacrifice. And it's interesting to me that, that, that the interval there was 2,000 years, from the time of Abraham and Isaac to the time of the sacrifice was 2,000 years, or two prophetic days. Uh, sort of, that in itself kind of foreshadows something to me. Yes. And in Philippians 2, 8, again it is said, being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Calvary is actually was a part of the northern ridge of Mount Moriah. Mm -hmm. Of course, it has been separated by uh, the people in Jerusalem back about 400 years before the birth of Christ when they dug a valley out of that mountain ridge and separated what is called Calvary today, at least Gordon's Calvary, where uh, we feel Christ uh, could very well have been crucified, and uh, the Temple Mount itself. So all that was a part of, the, of a ridge line mm -hmm. of the top of Mount Moriah. So Christ essentially was sacrificed on the same mountaintop that Isaac was. And this, mm -hmm. this uh, lamb, the, a ram that was caught in the thicket, mm -hmm. that became a substitute for Isaac, this was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who was the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. It's a beautiful picture. And more than beautiful, it's meaningful because it tells us that there are no accidents with God. God plans far, far in advance. And I give you an idea of what we're talking about here, Isaac being an allegory of Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. This is speaking of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. There it is. That little word figure there refers to the allegorical style of this story. The deeper meaning that even though Isaac was not raised from the dead, it was a figure of the son who would die and be raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 5, 8 says, Though he were a son, this is referring to Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And so we, we have the testing of both Abraham and Isaac. Abraham did not shirk to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac did not run away. Mm -hmm. And later on we find that Jesus did not run away. He, he cried to the Lord, if, let, Please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. And he, he was obedient. And so we have uh, Isaac's actions as a prophecy, basically, of Jesus' actions. And here's another point in the allegory. In Hebrews chapter 11, we are told by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Does that sound familiar? Mm. Does that have a familiar <laughs> ring to it? Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God. Isaac was the only begotten son of Abraham. It's interesting here that he's called the only begotten son because there's Ishmael mm -hmm. and there are the six sons of Keturah. But they were not born of promise. They were not born of Sarah. And so the wife God promised him, Sarah, 
became the one who bore his only begotten son. And it's important that Sarah and Abraham are the, are the two that are noted here mm -hmm. as producing an only begotten son, mm -hmm. the seed of Abraham. And what's fascinating to me is that this term only begotten then carries in it not only the meaning that we usually associate with it uh, as in singular, but also it has the meaning of freedom. In Christ we are free. And this is the, the meaning of only begotten. Now, we have seen Isaac is a type of Christ in his birth and in his sacrifice. Let's look at the bride of Isaac. The story here is typical or an allegory of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for example, God uh, had Abraham to send his servant, an unnamed servant, off to uh, the Mesopotamia Valley to find a bride for Isaac. He is a type of the Holy Spirit who sort of remains unnamed. That is, the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. He is the humble part of the uh, Trinity. He is the one who does not uh, exalt himself. Instead, he points others to Christ. And so was this job of the servant. Now, the apocryphal book of Jasher calls this servant Eleazar. And so Eleazar was told of Abraham to go into uh, the Mesopotamia Valley, the land of Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor, Abraham's brother, and there he should find a bride for Isaac. And off he goes. Off he goes in search of a bride. He comes to a, an oasis, and uh, no doubt this is the site of a community. And he stands by a well, and uh, traditionally women came to the well to draw water for their households. What a great place to shop for a bride. And he prays mm -hmm. to God a special prayer. To, to shop? For a bride? <laughs> I like yes. that. He prays, he says, Let it come to pass that the damsel whom I shall, to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And by the way, if the first one hadn't taken him up on that, he could have got a lot of water that day. Yes, he could. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. No sooner had he prayed that prayer until God answered it, just like that. Uh -huh. You know, it's interesting to me that this young lady, Rebecca, is uh, such a beautiful picture of the redeemed. Uh, the word Rebecca, and we, we were talking about this before we went on the, the air today. Rebecca mm -hmm. has a multiplicity of meanings. It can mean to bond or to tie together. Uh, it comes from a word root which means attractive, and one dictionary says that uh, this, uh, this means to be so attractive that someone is, is attracted to you in a bonded sort of way. That you're so attractive that uh, you feel bound to this person. In other words, she was a knockout. Yes. She, w she could knock you off your feet. I guess that's the reason why when Isaac saw her, he fell in love with her at first sight. Mm -hmm. He was just overwhelmed with her beauty. And she is a type of Christianity, the bride of Christ. And uh, there came the time, however, when Eleazar, or this, what is in the Bible, the unnamed servant of Abraham, had to ask her uh, if she would become the bride mm -hmm. of Isaac. And he, uh, he talked with Laban about this, and uh, Laban brought her into the room, and he said, Wilt thou go with this man? And she answered, I will go. Now, I want you to know, friend, that the only way you can become a member of the bride of Christ is to answer the call in the affirmative. The invitation is given for you to accept Christ as your Savior, but you must say yes. If you say no, he will not force you to be. And I think that's the point we should make here. As a matter of fact, we've just been discussing the plan of salvation, the God's plan for redemption, and we've been discussing it in terms of real human beings whose lives actually tell the story in advance of what was going to happen later. This is allegorical representation. Absolutely. And from that union came Jacob and Esau, which I think are characteristics of New Testament Christianity. 
Um, some are like a supplanter, Ooh. and some are like Israel, a prince with God. And some are like Esau. <laughs> and so we have those factions in Christianity to this very day. But these are allegories. I think this is a fascinating study of the allegorical view of Scripture. No need to discard allegory. It's there, plain as the nose on your face.